Welcome back to Star Trek Nitpickers. I'm your host, Commander Corbo. Today, Gene Roddenberry's letter to Isaac Asimov. That's right, Commander Corbo. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Please take a minute to subscribe if you like this video. So, you may have heard the story in a Leonard Nimoy interview or read it in an article about the original Star Trek, but in a nutshell, Isaac Asimov, the author of I, Robot and one of the most famous science fiction authors of all time, an extremely prolific writer, wrote an article for TV Guide about the many scientific inaccuracies in science fiction TV shows of the day, and this is back in the 60s when the original Star Trek was on. Much to the chagrin of Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, Asimov did not spare Star Trek in his attack on the factually incorrect. Asimov had some good things to say about Star Trek II. He was actually writing about the second pilot, an episode called Where No Man Has Gone Before. Here's what he had to say. In an episode of Star Trek, which seems to have the best technical assistance of the current crop, a mysterious gaseous cloud is sighted, quote, one half light year outside the galaxy, end quote. But the galaxy doesn't have a sharp edge. The stars just get fewer and fewer and trail off. To speak of anything being one half light year outside the galaxy is like saying a house is one half yard outside the Mississippi Basin. Gene Roddenberry read the article and decided he had to respond to the famous author, who he admired and respected very much. I was lucky enough to find the letter he wrote to Asimov in its entirety on lettersofnote.com. I'll read it to you now. So this letter was actually written on my birthday, but actually a good decade before I was born. 29th of November, 1966. Dear Isaac, sorry I had to address it in this roundabout way since I did not have your address and Harlan Ellison, who might have supplied it, is working a final draft for us and is already a week late, and I don't want to take his attention away from it for even a moment. On second thought, I believe he is a month or two late. Wanted to comment on your TV Guide article, What Are a Few Galaxies Among Friends? Enjoyed it as I enjoy all your writing, and it will serve as a handy reference to those of our Star Trek writers who do not have an SF background. Although, to be perfectly honest, those with SF background and experience tend to make the same mistakes. I've found that the best SF writing is no guarantee of science accuracy. A person should get his facts straight when writing anything, so, as much as I enjoyed your article, I am haunted by this need to write you with the suggestion that some of your facts were not straight. And just as a writer writing about science should know what a galaxy is, a writer writing about television has an obligation to acquaint himself with pertinent aspects of that field. In all friendliness, and with sincere thanks for the hundreds of wonderful hours of reading you have given me, it does seem to me that your article overlooked entirely the practical, factual, and scientific problems involved in getting a television show on the air and keeping it there. Television deserved much criticism, not just SF alone, but all of it, but that criticism should be aimed, not shotgunned. For example, Star Trek almost did not get on the air because it refused to do a juvenile science fiction, because it refused to put a lassie aboard the spaceship, and because it insisted on hiring Dick Matheson, Arlen Ellison, A.E. Von Vaught, Phil Farmer, and so on. Not all of these came through, since TV scripting is a highly difficult specialty, but many of them did. In the specific comment you made about Star Trek, the mysterious cloud being one half light year outside the galaxy, I agree, certainly, that this was stated badly, but on the other hand, it got past a Rand Corporation physicist who is hired by us to review all of our stories and scripts, and further, got past Kellum DeForest Research, who was also hired to do the same job. And, needless to say, it got past me. We do spend several hundred dollars a week to guarantee scientific accuracy, and several hundred more dollars a week to guarantee other forms of accuracy, logical progressions, etc. Before going into production, we made up a writer's guide covering many of these things, and we send out new pages, amendments, lists of terminology, excerpts of science articles, etc. to our writers continually, and to our directors and specific science information to our actors depending on the job they portray. For example, we are presently accumulating a file on space medicine for DeForest Kelly, who plays the ship's surgeon aboard the USS Enterprise. William Shatner, playing Captain James Kirk, and Leonard Nimoy, playing Mr. Spock, spend much of their free time reading articles, clippings, SF stories, and other material we send them. Despite all of this, we do make mistakes, and will probably continue to make them. The reason? Thursday has an annoying way of coming up once a week, 
And five working days an episode is a crushing burden, an impossible one. The wonder of it is not that we make mistakes, but that we are able to turn out once a week science fiction which is, if we are to believe SF writers and fans who are writing to us in increasing numbers, the first true SF series ever made on television. We like to think this is what we are trying to do and trying with considerable pride and I suppose with considerable touchiness when we believe we are criticized unfairly, or, as in the case of your article, damned with faint praise. Quoting Ted Sturgeon, who made his first script attempt with us, and now seems firmly established as a contributor to good television, getting Star Trek on the air was impossible. Putting out a program like this on a TV budget is impossible. Reaching the necessary mass audience without alienating the select SF audience is impossible. Not succumbing to network pressure to juvenilize the show is impossible. Keeping it on the air is impossible. We've done all of these things. Perhaps someone else could have done it better, but no one else did. Again, if we are to believe our letters, now mounting into the thousands, we are reaching a vast number of people who never before understood SF or enjoyed it. We are, in fact, making fans, making future purchasers of SF magazines and novels, making future box office receipts for SF films. We are, I sincerely hope, making new purchasers of the Foundation novels and iRobot, the rest of the robots, and others of your excellent work. We, and I personally, in our own way, and beset with the strange problems of this mass communications media, work as proudly and as hard as any other SF writer in this land. If mention was to be made of SF in television, we deserved much better. And as much as I admire you and your work, I felt an obligation to reply. And I believe the public deserves a more definitive article on all this. Perhaps TV Guide is not the marketplace for it, but if you ever care to throw the Asimov mind and wit toward a definitive TV piece, please count on us for facts, figures, sample budgets, practical production examples, and samples of scripts from rough story to the usual multitude of drafts, samples of mass media pressure, and whatever else we can give you. Sincerely yours, Gene Roddenberry. So Asimov seemed to take the letter in a friendly manner. The two of them, Gene Roddenberry and Asimov, actually ended up becoming friends, and Asimov became a fan of Star Trek. Roddenberry actually wrote to Asimov again when he had a problem between some of the actors on the original Star Trek show, and he needed some advice on how to resolve it, so he turned to one of the smartest guys that he knew. And I'll read you those letters in another video. I also just wanted to point out quickly that Ted Sturgeon, the writer that Roddenberry mentions in his letter, is actually the man who inspired Kilgore Trout, a reoccurring character in the works of Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Kurt Vonnegut was tickled by the fact that there could be a man named after a fish, and so we got Kilgore Trout, who actually ended up becoming sort of an alter ego for Kurt Vonnegut. Anyway, Ted Sturgeon went on to become a very well-known science fiction author, and you know, he also wrote the screenplay for the episode of Star Trek Amok Time, which is where we first heard that beautiful sentence, Live long and prosper. <laughs>